Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back. And thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Talking Each Other Home. This is a place where we can come and talk openly and honestly about all things spirit stuff. And my intention and mission with this podcast is to interview people about their stories and their lessons and their wisdom and their journey along the spiritual path so that it may empower and enlighten your journey and my journey as we walk and talk each other home. And so welcome back. I am your host, Danny. And joining me today, I have Nikki Dorn. And this was a really inspiring and magical and interesting podcast for me. And just to give you a little bit of a background, I met Nikki in Sedona, Arizona at the Fit for Service campsite. And more recently, I was invited to join her in a cannabis ceremony. So she led us through cannabis and breath work in a very beautiful, respectful setting. And if you want to hear more about my personal journey with that, I recorded a podcast so you can just you know, go listen to it when you can, but just know that this is the beautiful facilitator that led us through. And it's really cool to listen to where she comes from. So she is uh, an RN. So she's a nurse. She's also studied the priestess path and clinical herbalism and being a psychedelic guide and witchcraft or being a witch. Um, She went to something called witch, witch camp. And when I say witch, you know, sometimes that word is weird to people. And I don't know why, but maybe through the ages, it sort of built up this energy, but I hope this episode today excites you about being a witch and letting your witch self out of the closet, because really what being a witch is, is earth magic. It's learning how to work with the elements and the directions and, um, the earth. And it doesn't mean that you have to necessarily put bad spells on people. There's all different kinds of witches, but I just want to excite you about that word instead of turn you off because it's kind of like a shaman, you know, shamans work with the earth and the animals and the directions and the elements too. Um, so I don't know. Anyway, being a witch for some reason excites me. <laughs> Maybe it's cause it's earth magic. Um, but during this episode, we get to hear about her journey through nursing school and how she was working with people and how she started to notice that sometimes emotional traumas can lead to physical ailments. And that led her into working with clinical herbalism. Uh, I think it's called vitalism is the word she talked about. And then becoming a psychedelic guide or sitter or therapist sort of with cannabis and her priest, her journey as a priestess and learning about the priestess path and what that means. And it's such a beautiful divine commitment that you make between yourself and divinity and the earth and how you show up in the world. And I think that's, that's something that hit me really hard today was somebody asked me the other day, what her priestess was. And I, I energetically, I feel it, but it was hard for me to articulate what it actually means. Um, and I tried my best and I got really close, which, which excited me. Um, so yeah, this, this, this podcast is really cool. Cause Nikki to me is like a multifaceted, like green crystal. And she comes from all these different areas, like the nursing, the priestess, the witch, the herbalist the psychedelics. So it's really an amazing, well-rounded, respectful, educated, articulate episode. And I have all of the links to that. You can find Nikki, join her email list, check her out on her website or Instagram, or join us for the next, you know, guided cannabis journey that's coming up uh, in March. So check it out, check her out. Enjoy this episode. Thank you so much for joining us and for spending your time and energy with us. I appreciate you more than you know. And uh, yeah, without further ado, enjoy the show. Boom. Nikki, welcome to the show, Talking Each Other Home. I am so excited to have you here with me today. I am so excited to be with you today. Yay. (laughs) Yay. So we have so much to talk about. And just to preface this a little bit, um, you're an RN, so nurse Nikki, and then you're into clinical herbalism, uh, a little bit of witchcraft, or maybe a lot of bit of witchcraft, the high priestess path, cannabis ceremonies, all. And I have such a beautiful story that I'm going to actually tell on a podcast of what you led me through, because it was so amazing for me and so profound. And I just in learning about how the way cannabis works, but even the visions that I saw and the new relationships I have with my chakras now. So There's really, I think that you come from so many different cool facets. Like you, you feel like this multifaceted 
sort of diamond to me, like this crystal that you have all of these really cool earth medicines and perspectives and stuff I want to talk about and get into today. Um, and so I guess to, to kick it off, where did you start with your whole path? Did, did being a nurse kick you off into all of these other healing arts in this, you know, exciting spiritual path, or how did that sort of get born and transform? You know, it's a little bit of both. I mean, this is the fascinating thing about life, right? Is it's all the little breadcrumbs that lead you to where you are. So, I mean, I remember always being into astrology, always as a young kid. Um, and then moving to Colorado and um, living with my roommate, and she was into crystals and rocks and started getting into that. But it was very like superficial level of, you know, that sort of metaphysical world. Um, and I would say I didn't really embrace my healing nature until I became a nurse for sure. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, my pathway towards nursing, I was never the kid who was like, I'm going to be a nurse when I grow up. I mean, if you had asked me when I was younger, if I wanted to be a nurse, I would have thought you were nuts. Um, but you know, over time I realized that life is really fun to live and I was traveling a lot and I liked working with people and um, a friend of mine, I used to work in a restaurant and a friend of mine started nursing school. And he was like, you know, I really think that you would really like nursing. You should look into it. And to be honest with you, it was like, well, I can work three 12 hour shifts and I can be a travel nurse and I can, you know, pick my schedule. I'm in, I'm count me in. And it wasn't until then, I mean, fortunately it worked out because I absolutely love being a nurse. I love the relationships I get to create with my patients. Um, yeah. And it was that path, you know, that, that really led me to understanding my own, um, just really natural ability to help guide people towards health and create these trusting relationships and yeah, just really beautiful practice. Mm. And then it sort of, you know, <laughs> bubbled from there. <laughs> Yeah. It's, and I have such a soft spot for nurses. My mom's a nurse, my grandma's a nurse. So I just love, and it's just such a beautiful industry of service and heart centered, you know, just being with people and taking care of them and really caring about them. So I, I have a soft spot forever, forever, ever and ever about nurses. Um, and so, okay. So what was the first thing that you were like, okay, nursing's great, but, and then there's this. Yeah. You know, so I remember, um, when I was in school for nursing, um, actually it was probably my prerequisites. And I took a, a nutrition class that was taught by a naturopathic doctor. And just the way that he presented the information, uh, the way that he presented nutritional health and just really the idea that everything that we consume becomes us, um, it's really woke me up to this idea that I wanted to eventually veer towards some kind of holistic care, but I just wasn't even sure what that would look like. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, probably about two to three years into working as a nurse, I just started to become really disenchanted because I was seeing firsthand how uh, modern medicine handles chronic illness. Listen, I am, I'm, I believe in modern medicine. I believe that there is a time and a place for it. So I'm not pooping on, <laughs> on Western medicine at all, but, um, yeah, I just, you know, when it comes to chronic illness, we don't give any education around nutrition. Um, we don't really do a lot of preventative conversation. It's like, here are your pharmaceutical medications to cover up your symptoms and send you up, send you out the door and we'll more than likely see you back here again soon, you know? So it was that moment that I think I really started to, um, okay, it's time, it's time, you know, to, to search for the next thing. And, um, I started making, uh, body products with herbs because I was on my own healing path. We all are, I still am. <laughs> and I was trying to eliminate all the toxins that we have in our lives and all the things and chemicals. And so I was like, well, I want to make my own body care products and started playing with herbs and books. And that was it. I mean, once I started playing with different herbal, like herb medicines, herbal medicines, I was like, yes, I want to know more. Oh, that's awesome. And so is, is this how clinical herbalism sort of spun out? And what does it mean to be a clinical herbalist versus just somebody who's maybe into it? It seems like there's a little bit more training and stuff behind it. 
Yeah. So clinical herbalism. So there are many community herbalism or herbalists and, um, you know, they're there. And, and honestly, that's really what witches are and were, right. It was the community herbalists that know how to um, work with plant medicines energetically and physically, um, clinical herbalism definitely uses, uses some of that information. Um, but it's a little bit more science-based and focused on, treating, um, not just treating symptoms like modern medicine, but really getting to the root. So it's, you know, it's, it's very involved, you know, you have like an extensive intake, uh, where you're looking over every facet of the human body, not just our physical health, but I mean, you're getting into details, like what is your sleep like? What are your bowel movements? Like anybody who knows me knows I like to talk about poop. So, <laughs> um, yeah, just, it's really in depth. And then it's taking that information with a more medical lens and, you know, trying to figure out what is the root cause of these things and how can we, um, change your nutrition, um, maybe look at some lifestyle changes and then use herbs to support the body in doing what it knows how to do best. So I studied, um, vitalist herbalism which is, you know, my years of experience in the hospital, I had this sense and I'll, I'll explain it, but I had this sense. And then I started school. And when they were talking about what vitalism is, which is that our bodies are so vastly intelligent. There is a vital force in us all. I think about when you cut your hand and it heals. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to do anything. It heals. Mm -hmm. And on a grander scale, that's what's happening all the time in our body. The problem is, is that we begin to put obstacles in the way. Could be, you know, foods that you're eating that cause inflammation. It could be, you know, too much stress in your life. There's a lot of reasons that our body can't do what it knows how to do best because there's a lot of obstacles. So vitalism is really just removing obstacles to cure. And then supporting the body with herbs. So I remember learning and I was like, yes, <laughs> you know, where you learn something and you just feel like all the sparks in your body are like, I'm right where I'm meant to be. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> and such a beauty. And I feel like that's really starting to come online now with the way people are looking at the medical industry. They're saying like, yes, there's a time and a place, but I think there's another way like naturopathic doctors in the last, I don't know, five, seven years feels like everybody's talking about going to see one now. Whereas I've never heard that term before you know, 10 years prior now herbalism is becoming like a really huge thing. And so like, what's an example of, of an herb that we could use that we all might have lying around or like something that's like a, a household thing we could all go get, I don't know, from the store or a local market. Like, what does that look like? <laughs> <clears throat> um, there's so many, <laughs> um, yeah, I, the first thing that's popping into my mind is chamomile. Everybody has heard of chamomile. You can buy it in a tea form to go to sleep. But chamomile is actually a really amazing herb in a lot of ways. Um, it can help with digestive issues and also calms the nervous system. And I think in our society today, we have a lot of stress and we already know that there's the gut brain connection. It's an it's undeniable. And so when you have stress, many times you have digestive upset and that could present as, you know, IBS is one of them that I think a lot of people get, per, you know, they get diagnosed IBS, which is basically just a doctor saying, you know, I don't know, here's a prescription and take this where there's much deeper um, ways uh, or therapeutics to heal it. So chamomile is one of my favorites. Uh, it's easy to grow in most parts of the United States and you can make your own medicine really easily. Um, yeah. And you can take it in tincture form, which I love. Um, and really it's gentle. It's not something that will put you to sleep, you know, like some other stronger nervines. It's just, it'll calm the nervous system. And I think that is the biggest thing that we need in our society is, is calming the nervous system. Yeah. Rewiring. So that would be one of them. Do you want me to say another one? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, one of my favorites is dandelion because it grows everywhere. It grows everywhere. And it's so the greens are actually uh, the most nutritious greens that you can find um, full of vitamins and minerals and um, the actual flower itself also contains those. And then the root is really good for your liver and your digestive system. So now you might be thinking like, am I going to go around and like pick dandelions? You can, if you want. I mean, 
you know, in the spring, you can go out and pick the leaves. Make sure that you're not picking dandelions from sprayed fields, fields because a lot of fields are sprayed with um, Roundup, which is glyphosate, which is really, really terrible for your gut. So if you are going to go out foraging for dandelions, just be aware of that. But you can pick the leaves and just rinse them off. You can saute them um, with lemon and, and uh, olive oil and garlic. They're really delicious. So really great, just great for nutritional status and minerals and liver and all around good herb. And it's right there in your backyard. Um, okay. So I'm kind of mind blown. So I'm picturing, so the green, so you mean like the stem and like the leaves that come off of the little yellow flower dandelion mm -hmm. and then yeah. the root. So you can take the whole, the whole flower and put it in a saute dish and saute it up. Or do you just take the greens? I typically, if I'm doing a saute, I'll just take the greens. Okay. Um, I can also, you can make like a, a vinegar or a vinaigrette. So I'll take the greens and the flowers and then put them in apple cider vinegar and let them sit, you know, for, a week or so, and then you're leaching all of those minerals and vitamins out into the apple cider vinegar. But yeah, for greens, I just do greens, saute greens. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I used to use dandelion root tea when I was bodybuilding, um, because it would get rid of the water and get like, I would use that coming into a show a little bit. It would kind of help with the excess water retention. And so now I'm mm -hmm. learning about there's all different causes or all different things that dandelion can help with. And it's right out our back door and chamomile is like grows so easily. So it's like all these little, these beautiful little herbs that this medicine that's sprinkled all across the earth for us to use. It's really cool yeah. that you're doing this and tapping it. So do you, do you work with clients and sort of go through their charts or go through their symptoms and help them with different prescriptions or yeah. Yeah. So I'll do, um, they, there's a really in-depth intake form. And then, um, the first, um, session is like, it's usually about two hours because we're just talking about so much. And I think that's the difference. Um, again, I don't want to knock Western medicine, you know, physicians just don't have enough time to, to really get into the depth of, of this assessment. And they really don't get a lot of nutritional education either. So, you know, their, their place is really pharmaceutical medicines and treating symptoms and ruling out things that are more serious. And I think that's why I, my position in this as the clinical herbalist is that because of my experience as a nurse, I'm able to spot things, you know, that really need to be addressed further. You know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not trying to treat as a doctor. Um, really, I'm just looking at, uh, you know, the whole human and nutritional status. And, and if I see something that I'm like, I think that we need to escalate this a little bit and you need to go get some more serious conditions ruled out. So yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a beautiful process. And I've, I've gotten feedback that a lot of people just in the act of filling out that intake form and having that first assessment really wakes up a lot of awarenesses within, because we just get so used to things sometimes like, Oh, you know, I only, I only poop once every three days. That's just normal for me. Here I go talking about poop again. <laughs> Well, it's a big thing. I understand. It's like you said, the gut brain connection and everything happens in our gut. So I, I respect the poop talk. I think it's really important and something people don't talk about nearly enough. And that can tell so much what's going on with you is it like from stress to serotonin, like all that stuff that gets produced down there. It's like a huge, it's a huge deal. So I wanted to talk about witch camp and how, um, learning different, rituals is what I want to call them. Um, how that kind of goes in line with herbalism and the energy practices, and even a little bit about your high priestess path. So, you know, I'm infinitely curious about all three of these things. So if you don't mind telling me about maybe like that, which part in you awakening and how you discovered that word and what it felt like, and kind of that whole journey and process too. Um, cause I'm all, I'm loving this right now. Okay. <laughs> Oh gosh. Um, yeah. I mean the, the witchy thing, it's funny. Cause I, I remember being a kid and playing, like I was making witches brew and a lot of us probably did that. Um, and then kind of fast forward me and my roommate, we would, um, we have a book of spells and this was when I was probably 19, you know, and we'd go outside and we'd bury things and do the spell and, and never anything that I took very seriously, except that I really loved, you know, the idea of magic. I mean, I was a little girl who had unicorns everywhere. So, um, and then, I had an astrology reading. This was probably like seven years ago, maybe even longer, but I had an astrology reading 
And um, she's an astrologer, but also an intuitive, uh, Juliana McCarthy. She's a really wonderful astrologist um, who I follow. Uh, she did this reading and she said something in the reading along the lines of, you know, perhaps you were a witch in the past and burned at the stake. And, you know, that's why you have a lot of fear. And I think she was talking about my Chiron. In the moment that she said that word, I felt like every cell in my body just awoken, awoke, awake, uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, woke up, you know, it was, it was um, an experience that I will never forget because it was really important in my path. And shortly after the way the universe drops things in your lap when you're ready for them, um, uh, this, this uh, school called Witch Camp popped up and Maya Toll uh, does this program. I'm not so sure if she still runs it, but I, one, loved the name of it. I was like, Witch Camp? I'm going to go to Witch Camp. But it was really, um, it was really getting deeper into what does it mean to be a witch and how do you bring in these rituals and practices? I had been, you know, playing around with Oracle cards and stuff like that, but I didn't really um, have the foundation. Nobody teaches this stuff, you know, like back in the days, like it was something not necessarily with Oracle cards, but it was something that was passed along, you know, through oral tradition. And so which, which camp was really about um, how, being a witch in general is like how we can utilize the elements of the earth um, and our own intention and our own consciousness to manifest and to, um, I don't, I don't know, continue on our path for our highest good. And that's the thing that I love about it. I'm not somebody who does a lot of spells, you know, for me, I'm, I'm a, I'm a green witch for sure. So it's a lot of plants and earthy medicine, but, um, it's, you know, if you're, if you're putting your energy in this direction and you're really calling in the elements, um, and using earth magic, you can really begin to navigate your life you know, and, and for the good. And I'm not talking about like, I want to win a million dollars, you know, it, it's more, um, yeah, from the heart, you know, things, things that really matter in this world, you know, from kindness and healing and love. And so I took witch camp and that just, you know, expanded my practice and, um, fast forward years later, um, deeper into astrology, um, went to school for herbalism, which really, I mean, that, that was an invaluable experience, uh, just reconnecting me back to all the healing that earth offers. Mm. And, um, and then, you know, it's, you know, how sometimes you don't really understand how things come to you. You just, you hear it and it wakes you up I the word priestess kept coming into my circle, my thoughts. And of course, I was like priestess, like, who am I? You know, I pushed it away because it felt like a title that, um, I wasn't worthy of, you know, there's that whole, uh, sense of lack of worth. And, um, just in the continued synchronicities, I decided to pursue, um, a, like a mentorship program, a year and a day spiral, um, priestess of the rose. And it's following the Venus cycle and, um, different goddesses that present themselves on the cycle. And it's very much about, um, gnosis of self, you know, really, really getting to the heart of who we are, removing conditioning and wounds and shadows. And, um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't refer to myself as a high priestess, uh, but I would definitely refer to myself as a priestess. And, and that is somebody who has made a commitment, a spiritual commitment to be a conduit of heaven and earth, um, to just, you know, put my heart into helping, um, evolve our consciousness and helping others, guiding others to wake up to their own divinity and their own power. So mm. it's pretty magical. It's, it's pretty, it's like the whole thing of it is amazing. And somebody asked me the other day what a priestess was or a high priestess. And I was kind of trying to find the words and I was close. I was like, it's a, a an agreement or a devotional path. And you kind of are this 
it's just how you show up in the world. It's like, I think it's like a personal commitment that you make to your path and to spirituality and to the divine that it's kind of like you take that priestess energy with you, no matter what you do, whether you're in the grocery store or nursing or leading a cannabis ceremony, you just show up as this priestess and it's a devotion and a commitment. Um, yeah. Well, it's so, oh, it just makes me want to And then you yeah. mix that with the earth magic and yes. it just feels so on point and so exciting. Um, okay. What, what were some of your biggest ahas from like witch camp or, or studying with the priestess um, lineage and path? Like what were some of the big ones where you were like, oh, that's the missing key? Oh, um, there's so much. Um, the first thing that's coming into my mind is that I, I had never really had any experience, uh, working with gods and goddesses and deities. Uh, I didn't understand that. And, um, not that my mind was close to it. I just didn't have any experience and I didn't understand it. And, um, you know, having this, this guidance and this mentorship on this priestess path, I was taught how to, um, go into deep guided meditations, uh, bringing in the energy of different goddesses. And, um, you know, for, for me, the ones who have been really present in my life and especially in the psychedelic therapy that I've been doing, um, you know, we have Mary Magdalene and mother Mary and Yeshua Jesus. And I'm not a religious person. I, I was not raised with the Bible. I, I don't know a lot about these, these people, um, you know, until I sort of followed this path. And what I find is that what comes in to, to my meditation sessions is their energy. And you can call in different goddesses. Like there's Morgana who, um, often presents in, uh, the time around Halloween or Samhain, uh, and, or you can call her in at any time, but she's the goddess of, I want to say darkness, um, which sounds scary, but it's actually really bringing up these shadows, making them very present in your life so that you can, for once actually embrace them, make friends with them, love them and not let them take over your life. Um, you know, where Isis, Isis is a goddess of ugh, just immense power and strength and bringing in her energy. You can just feel that you're like, you are guided, you're protected. You are um, in presence of just really amazing strength. So yeah, working with goddesses and gods has been a really impactful experience and also just creating my own altar you know, and, um, and using our senses to, um, creating our, our room, our house, our altar. I mean, we're surrounding ourselves with our sacred energy. And so I think that, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a big part. yeah, it's important, you know, it's our space and what we create and what we decide to offer our devotion to is really important. And you can be devoted to so many things. It doesn't have to be earth magic or, I mean, it's just being devoted to something um, and having a sense of discipline, uh, is, I think is really important in our lives, in our human lives. So good. So the, when you were talking about the goddesses, I, I was getting goosebumps all over my body. Cause that's something that I'm journeying with now and just starting to understand. Um, I'm, I'm really into the Hindu culture right now. So I have Ganesha on my desk. I have a couple Hanuman statues. I have Lakshmi over here. And when I've been yeah. meditating lately, I now I'm developing a relationship where I listen to the chanting and I'm like sitting on Ganesha's shoulder as we're going through the forest and sort of clearing the path and you know, I have this whole kind of romance that goes on with these different deities and it's been so exciting. And Isis was one that I worked with and I'd like to get more into the female goddess. You know, I've heard this name Magdalene a lot, Mary Magdalene. And I don't know, it's been said probably 10 times to me. So I feel like I need to probably do a little bit more research, but there's something there. Um, so do like, what's the energy of like Mary Magdalene? What does that feel like? Oh gosh. Um, just so much love. Um, you know, Yeshua and Magdalene, 
um, and Mother Mary, you know, their their path and really why they were prosecuted was because they they really were just about, you know, the Christ consciousness, right? It's like living from the heart. I mean, fully and deeply living from the heart, even speaking about it, I can just feel it's like a warm energy that feels um, all encompassing and just like you're held and protected and yeah, just divine. It's, it's, it's divine feminine and masculine. I don't, I, that's the best I can <laughs> articulate it right now. Just love really, really just Christ consciousness from the heart love. Okay. That's actually helpful. Cause I understand a little bit of Christ consciousness. I've heard it. Like we actually did a meditation with one of my coaches earlier today with it. And we brought in and how it was like the intersection between heaven and earth and then masculine and feminine coming out to the right and left. And it was this beautiful feeling of unity, but it all connected at the heart it was like sort of the intersection point of all of this. So if Magdalene is kind of along the same lines or in the same group as Yeshua or Jesus, that kind of makes sense to me that it's like this divine unconditional love. And that is the love that alchemizes. That is the love that heals and that can move mountains. So, yeah. okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I probably like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I love, love today's it. Actually, 22 is the, the number of Magdalene. So oh. today's 222. Oh so. my gosh. Yeah. That as she came up with our conversation. <laughs> oh. Yeah, everybody, as we're recording this, um, it's 2.22 and we actually started at 11.11 when we popped on <laughs> Zoom with each other. So it was cool. So we're, lots of alignment sauce happening today. And it's associated with Magdalene. Is that what you said? Yeah, the number 22. And don't ask me why it's in my big book of all my information that I'm still, you know, it's a the, the path of the priestess and all of these, all the information in the myths is a lot of information. And so I will not... Um, you know, there's a lot, there's still a lot for me to, to learn. So don't ask me why <laughs> that, book right is now. Amazing. that book just looks, is just magical. Just looking at it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is for my year and a day spiral and just all the information that was passed along. And, um, again, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a, it's not a path that you're just like, I took a year of class and that's it. You know, it's, it's, um, it's really all encompassing and, and will be for the rest of my life. I'll continue to learn. Wonderful. Wonderful. So I want to talk about, well, I want to talk about two things. We talked about how emotions, the emotional body goes with the physical body and how the different healings happen there. Um, and how you were noticing stuff as a nurse and then, you know, learning what you know now energetically. Um, and then I do want to talk about the, what you've learned with cannabis ceremonies. So maybe we'll go with that, the energetics and emotional stuff first. And yeah. And I know you said you're big on emotions too. That was something we talked about when we did our integration call. So I'm curious about how learning about emotions has transpired and what your ahas were and sort of what's um, really present to you right now, as far as emotional health goes. Um, I mean, I think that a, a lot of, well, I'll start as, as working as a nurse. Um, I, one of my favorite things was getting into deep conversation with my patients and, you know, creating a really strong connection and bond. And what I started to notice after years of, of working with patients was that a lot of these illnesses, uh, seem to be associated with wounding and trauma. So emotional wounding and trauma and, um, it really became even more clear to me when I started working as a clinical herbalist and kind of getting more information about people's um, past history and seeing how their eating habits or their lifestyle habits were contributing to inflammatory pathways, you know, which eventually turned to chronic illness um, and how those were driven by uh, a lot of addictive behaviors, um, which were driven by trauma and wounding and apply that to my own life, you know, that I really started to do a lot of my own work. Um, you know, I'll be honest with you. I was pretty unaware for, um, many years, you know, just having fun and drinking a lot and not taking care of my body. And, um, I think when I started to become a nurse, I started to really be face to face with my own mortality, which is a good thing, right? Cause you start to, to, okay, 
well, I need to start taking care of my body. And it started there and um, eventually started inquiring in my own behaviors and my own wounds and trauma. And so I think between my experience with patients and, and just sort of observing their patterns and then taking that into my own healing journey, uh, what I realized was that I think therapy is amazing. And I think that, well, I, I, I don't want to should on anybody. I encourage people to seek out therapy in conjunction with other methods of self-exploration like psychedelic therapy. And for me, that was what started my path is that I had some experiences with psychedelics that changed my life. You know, they, they opened up this level of awareness that I wasn't able to have. And I continue to, to work on this path. I mean, I, I think healing, you know, if any healer is going to tell you that they figured it out and they have all the answers, um, I would call bullshit. Um, <laughs> you know, I just, I, I think that we're all healing together. We all do this together. And perhaps my guidance is just from what I've learned in my own path. Um, and I can take somebody's hand and, and show them what I've learned. And, um, yeah, so that's kind of what guided me towards, um, pursuing more training around, uh, cannabis assisted psychedelic therapy. Mm. I love that. It's getting to the root. It's not just like masking the symptoms with a prescription. It's like getting down deep into the emotional wounds, which cause our habits and cause this and cause that, and then cause dis-ease in our body. So I really like that you're digging in there with people to sort of look at, bring awareness to it, fill the void, patch it up, and then now go into your life. It's something that I've been noticing lately with um, like different addiction programs is that they don't necessarily go that deep. I mean, I know they do the 12 step stuff and things like that, but some, the healing to me feels like it could be deeper. It could be a little bit more spiritual based and like get in there more to patch those wounds that are causing the extra addictions and extra using. Um, I just feel like this kind of stuff would really be helpful, but in some of the programs, NA and AA and stuff like that, it's like, you're not, it's like very boxed in. And it feels like there's not a lot of room for alternative methods of healing, which are proven to be so beneficial for addictive behaviors. Um, So that's just something that I've been, it's been in my area a lot lately. Like I've had different people come and stay with me that are just fresh out of, you know, treatment, basically like different friends of family that end up on Cape Cod somehow that come to stay at my house. Um, so it's just been really tuned into that lately and wondering, is there any work I could do with that? Um, I don't know. So I think that's what just sparked. Well, and I think, you know, what you're saying, this is, this is the reason that the psychedelic revolution is upon us again, you know, it it happened in the sixties and then it got squashed by the government. And, you know, it's, it's upon us again, because our mental health, um, issues in our country are not even in our country in the world, but in our country specifically right now are kind of a mess. Um, you know, you look at the opioid crisis and I do think that the pandemic, um, you know, as challenging as it was, it has really, um, bubbled up to the surface, some things that, that need to be addressed and mental health is one of them. And so I think that's why psychedelic therapy is so popular or like starting to rise more and more people are questioning because it gets beyond cognitive therapy. So I think in conjunction, you know, and that's why integration is so important in these spaces is because you can have this deep inner experience and, you know, all kinds of awarenesses and visions and, you know, it, it can, it'll just remain there unless you have the support to sort of bring it into the 3d world where we're living right now. And I think cognitive therapy is very helpful in that. Um, you know, a lot of integration coaches are out there now there's, there's a lot of support and I think it's essential to bring the two together. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited that, that it's here and we have all these, you know, there's ketamine therapy, um, in Colorado, the natural medicine health act just passed. Um, so psilocybin will be legal next year to do therapy with, um, Ibogaine, um, DMT. So, you know, we're, we're in it. Mm, How exciting is that? Um, it's exciting. And I hope it, it's, it, I hope that the respect 
level of the plant medicine comes higher than the trendiness of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's very trendy and psychedelics is sort of a hot word. I love to talk about it. Um, and I've also gotten my ass kicked a lot by them. So I have a certain level of respect and understanding. It's, I don't talk about it because it's cool. I talk about it because it's changed so much in my life. And I really believe in the power of this. Um, but I really think that it is a medicine and should be taken lightly and, and respectfully, you know, so it can be sustained and, and really done right this time instead of blowing up being this amazing thing and then getting squashed by the government again. I, I feel like we're getting a second chance to research these compounds and, and it's like earth medicine, you know, like mushrooms and ayahuasca and even LSD comes from the ergot fungus. So it's like the earth is still providing her wonderful medicine. And that's where my trust comes with them is like, it comes from the earth. It's like, she's here to heal us. This is a, a beautiful relationship we have with mother earth. And the way I think about it, when people say that they're a little nervous about ayahuasca or mushrooms or something, I say like, she wants us to be beautiful humans for her planet. She wants us to be healed and whole and help others. And so whatever she shows us, it may be intense. Um, but I really feel like it's for our benefit because she wants us to be the best we can be to inhabit her. Um, yeah. So that's kind of, I think, you know, being nervous and having a healthy level of fear shows respect. You know, I think, I think that's good. It's like, no matter how many experiences I've had, I'm still nervous you know, going into something because I have respect. I have immense respect for, for what will be shown or, you know, what my experiences will be. So I think it's a beautiful thing to, you know, to, to show up with that reverence. Mm, yes, I agree. And uh, Dennis McKenna, so Terrence McKenna's brother, I was watching an in interview with him and he said, if you're not nervous going into an ayahuasca ceremony, then you're not paying attention. And I just yeah. was like, damn, that's so good. Um, and I think it's the reverence and amount of respect for it. So fast forward now into what you do today, what I got to experience with you, which was so beautiful. Cannabis led breathwork ceremony. Girl, I am still mind blown by that because <laughs> to preface this for everybody. I've been smoking on and off for years, 10 or more years. Um, and I've never used it in the way I got to two weeks ago with you. And it's changed my relationship in the way that I look at cannabis. Um, and so I just, I would love for you to talk about your journey through getting to that point even. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to, to echo, I think I hear that a lot from people, including myself when I first started is that they had no idea that cannabis could um, bring us these really profound experiences. Um, so it's funny what actually led me. So I, I had many visions, not in, in psychedelic spaces, but, um, doing some purpose guided meditations with a therapist. And, uh, they kept leading me to that. I, that I wanted to, um, serve plant medicine. And I had an experience with, with Bufo toad medicine, which is five MEO DMT. And, it, that was the most profound experience I had had. And it just, um, broke me open in so many beautiful, beautiful ways. And I felt like I want to provide this, you know, in some way. And, uh, the toad was initially sort of what came up, but, um, I am also a nurse and I have a nursing license and, you know, psilocybin in particular, cause that was the medicine that I was going for is a felony crazy. Um, and so I was like, well, I want to be above ground. I don't want to do this underground. I don't want to lose my license that I, that I care about. And, um, I started doing some research and in Boulder, there's, um, there's a facility called medicinal mindfulness and they do right now they do, um, cannabis assisted psychotherapy, and they also do ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And then they also have a school called the psychedelic sitter school that um, teaches you how to uh, hold and facilitate cannabis assisted sessions. So I, when I first read about it, I was like, can't, I mean, weed, <laughs> like, come on. And I, and I actually, um, I had a relationship. So when I was younger, I enjoyed smoking it. And then I moved to Colorado and the cannabis here, and then this was, you know, back in 2001 was way stronger than in Florida. And so anytime that I smoked, it was like, oh no, no, <laughs> like way, just way too much. And, and so I, I didn't have a good relationship with her anymore. Um, 
she made me really awkward and uncomfortable in my own skin. I would get really anxious. It was not a, a, a substance that I could use in, you know, with people, you know, with friends, because I would want to be like, I'm going to go over there and not say a word. And so um, when I started doing this research about medicinal mindfulness, um, there was a lot of fear that came up because I was like, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't really think that cannabis is my, is my plant medicine. Um, I started watching some videos and did a little more research and you, and I was like, I'm just going to trust. Like I kept being pulled towards it. So I'm, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to trust. And my first experience, so it's um, the way the program is set up, highly recommend for anybody who wants to pursue this, but um, you, you learn the mindfulness based skills. You, there's a lot of didactic stuff. And then you actually have your own experiences um, so that you understand what you're serving. And mind blown. I was mind blown. And there were four, 40 other people, maybe 30. And they were anywhere from smoked all day, every day to didn't smoke at all. And every single person was like, what? Like, I had no idea that cannabis could, could, I mean, and to take, take me to DMT spaces, you know, for extended periods of time. So um, I was sold <laughs> at that moment. I'm like, oh my gosh. And now I've been working with it for over a year. Um, and I've gone, you know, there's different training levels and I've gone all the way through the therapy portion. And I, it's one of my favorite medicines to work with. Um, you know, I think I'll pursue some psilocybin training in the fall with medicinal mindfulness, but I will continue to work with cannabis and, and especially in conjunction with breath work. Um, like you experienced, it is, it is really profound and, um, can help bring awareness to things that have been locked away. Um, it's been researched to really help with PTSD. Um, there's a lot of somatic release. Uh, it's deeply somatic medicine. You know, we have CB1 and CB2 receptors throughout our entire body, our blood vessels, our muscles, our organs. And then, um, you know, you have the THC, which is the psychoactive portion. And then you have a whole slew of, of cannabinoids that function in our bodies in ways that we probably don't even really fully understand. And in these sessions, um, because it's so somatic, you can have really big somatic releases where you're releasing trauma, you know, that's stuck in our body for who knows how long could be from when we were a baby and it could be from last week, you know? So beautiful medicine. Big fan. Big fan. Yeah. Me too. Now. And I was like, Oh, and my <laughs> going in was I want to develop a new relationship with her. Um, marijuana or cannabis, you know, I don't, I'm not sure which term I like better or, or like, but I want to, I want to find one. And that's like the name that, that I call her. Um, but I did, I got exactly what I asked for and it was a beautiful experience. And I think I emailed you right after the day after. And I was like, my jaw is still on the floor because what I saw was so clear. It was so, I could, I could literally draw everything. In fact, I did after we were done, I couldn't believe how clearly I was seeing, you know, the jewel in the middle of my chakras and then all these beautiful inscriptions in the ring. And then I went in and met all of my chakra selves and blessed each one of them with, and I was like my higher, it was like a crazy layers of me. And I met a new relationship, um, with the plant and myself. And it was just really interesting. And I feel that cannabis is maybe it can be a little slippery of a medicine. Whereas ayahuasca feels like you don't, you can't just do that every night kind of thing. You can't just go to the dispensary or grow it in your house. It's cannabis for me feels like you have to direct it. You have to like, sort of have it on rails for me. That's what I, what I noticed was, even during the experience, I kind of had to keep bringing my mind back. Like, nope, we're here, like focus. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's so accessible that it can be used out of respect and out of that reverence again. So that's for me, for personally, for me, that's what I have to watch myself with is yes, now you have this relationship, but how are you going to continue to use and nurture it? Yeah. Um, Cause it can be a little slippery there for me. And I do find that uh, when people have this more intentional experience, it does sort of increase the reverence, you know, cause we we've been conditioned. Well, one, we've been conditioned to be like, you know, it's weed. And that's why I don't call it marijuana because marijuana is associated with 
I think he was in the forties or fifties and, you know, it was very associated with racism, you know, Oh, let's say like, Oh, those scary immigrants that are coming from the South are bringing in their marijuana. And, and it's just very, it's like really tainted um, where I feel like the word cannabis um, kind of brings it out from all of these uh, very conditioned words, you know, even weed, you know, it's like, it just doesn't come with a feeling of reverence. So um, find the word that works for you. But yeah, I, I think that we've just been conditioned to either think that it's really terrible. It's a gateway drug. I mean, I grew up in the eighties, I'm 42. And so I remember, you know, having the dare to, to stay, what, what the dare program to be against drugs. And I had to sign a piece of paper that said I would never do drugs. And I remember thinking, yeah, I remember as, as a kid, I mean, I think it was probably 10 years old. And I remember signing this paper being like, this is really weird. <laughs> um, you know, and, and then beyond right now we have dispensaries and you can just go to the store and, you know, pick out your strain and how much THC. And so, yes, I, I a hundred percent agree, just like any substance, um, that's mind altering. It's something that you have to maintain a respectful relationship with. And I do think that when you experience it in these more intentional ways, it does, it, it kind of, you increase that, that awareness around like, oh, maybe I should, even if you smoke every day, which I don't necessarily think is bad, you know, um, you know, treat it with respect, you know, maybe light a candle or something, you know, maybe light some incense and be like, I'm going to smoke this bowl, you know, <laughs> just, just to, to have a much more respectful relationship with her. Hmm. I think that's great. And I like that you're not demonizing the use of it every day or like the use of the plant. Cause it's not, it's just, no. it's the intention with which I think can be shifted just a little bit. And then it can make it a little bit more of a beautiful experience. And then there won't be any sort of guilt attached to it, or I shouldn't be using it in this way. And that's, I'm kind of speaking to myself in that as well. Um, yeah. And I like, thank you for just for saying about marijuana versus cannabis. Cause I was looking pot doesn't sound right. Weed doesn't quite do it, but cannabis feels the most clean to me. Um, yeah. so I do. So thank you for helping me with that distinction. And I heard something, do you ever watch spirit science? It's like the little cartoon. Right. YouTube. No, All sounds right. fun. He's actually awesome patch man or something. Um, so he's this little cartoon and he goes into all different kinds of spiritual topics like Egypt. And there was even one on cannabis. So I watched that one and he said something in there that I hadn't heard before. And he said, it's like the tree of life. Number one was like how it is found for thousands of years all over the globe has been used to make t-shirts and paper and all of, you know, hemp and all these cool things. And I was like, okay, that's a really cool way to look at it versus getting out of that stoner stigma that was there. It's like, no, this is like the tree of life. And yeah. he said something else that we have commercialized THC and it's kind of gotten so far away from like what the original plant had, even the, the potency of it has um, been like, so almost like genetically modified to be like 90% THC when that's not actually like what, and like, if you go into a dispensary, how everything is like this amount of THC, this amount of THC. So it just, when he said commercialized THC, I was like, man, that kind of hits home versus like the natural plant that you would grow. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. That was just a big aha for me. I was like, oh, I'm going to start looking at that a little different now. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. And, and I will say, you know, as far as you can grow, you can, you can experience um, psychedelic cannabis without going to a dispensary and getting high THC levels. Um, it is a little bit easier though, because you don't have to smoke quite as much because it's, it's certainly about dosing when you're trying to get to the psychedelic levels and um, and another thing I wanted to, to say that I just love is like, you know, you look at the, the buds of a marijuana plant of a cannabis plant, you know, and it's like, they're so beautiful. I mean, really, it's like a flower, unlike anything I've ever seen. And there, there is, there is something really, really special and, and magical about the plant and the fact that we can use it for so many things. So I also hope to reframe a lot of conditioning around it as I've done within myself as well. 
I can't believe I'm talking publicly about this. I mean, if you would have talked to me like a year and a half ago, when I started this training, I was very like, Oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this work with, with weed. Like what are people going to think? And I think just in working with her so closely, I'm like, no, I want to spread it to the world because it's, you know, she's just such a beautiful plant. I agree. And it's so cool that we can talk about this in such a way that's not demonizing it. That's actually really honoring it and saying, Hey, there's, there's something here that's right under our nose. And it's so accessible. Like where I live in Massachusetts, it's legal. We could grow our own medicine Mm -hmm. and it's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, after the ceremony with you, I was like, man, I feel like the Northeast could use things like like ceremonies like this because it's legal here. So it's fine. You know, people could come right into my house. I could do it anywhere. anywhere. Um, I don't know. It was just really it like all like the, those little pew, 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 pew were going off for me. Yeah. And I haven't stopped thinking about it since, to be honest with you, I hear music and I'm like, Oh, this would be good for this part. Or that yeah. part or like these yeah. Things like afterwards I could lay out fresh fruit for everybody and just sort of have, you know, maybe five or six people, even up here in my spirit space, which is big enough. And it's like kind of wooden. So I have acoustic. So I don't know after you, you awoken, awoken, waked up. I don't know how to, <laughs> there I go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something inside of me. And I don't know where it's going to go just yet. I think I, my patience and I have to, you know, I've been looking into the medicinal mindfulness, but, um, I just have to, yeah, just one step at a time, keep going into that, uh, space. And also I have to say, I love your emails. Um, Nikki's plant medicine. Is that what you call it? Nikki's plants or something? Uh, well, so my website is nurse Nikki's.com. Um, but the email are magic and medicine, magic and medicine. I love it. Mm-hmm. And I just love all the the effort and energy that you put into them. It's been really nice to just, um, just watch you work with it's, it's, I think you come from such a cool background with the witch training, the priestess training, the cannabis training, the RN training and the herbal. It's like, what a cool soup that you provide just by being you. Um, so I just want to honor that for a minute and I appreciate it so much. Yeah. Um, Thank you for that reflection. Welcome. I'm so inspired by you. And I feel like you're just so (laughs) interesting and you've done uh, really cool things and and you're helping people with what you've learned in a really big way. So that to me is really inspiring. And it's not the typical norm that you see. Um, It's more, it's plus that. So it's inspiring. Yeah. My, my intention really is just to, oh gosh, reconnect us all with the earth you know, with the healing she provides and with our own spirits and with our own divinity, um, because that really is what makes the world a more beautiful place to live. Um, as, as we continue to understand how we can heal our bodies and the earth and how we can relate with others, um, the, the more and more people that, you know, for lack of a better term, wake up, um, the, the, the better our world can be, you know, and, we've experienced this, Danny, you know, and fit for service and being in this group of people, um, you know, we've experienced being in a community of people who are just in the heart center, you know, armor is down and you're able to just have deep conversations within seconds and, you know, have reverence for each other. Even if maybe you're not like, I love every person here, right? Because we're all humans and we're all different vibes, but you love every person there because we're a human and we're a community and we're in this together. And I can see that on a much grander scale one day. So. Yeah. And that's like, it's like the critical mass, right? It's like, if enough people start to look at it and feel that way, then the consciousness of the world starts to turn and, um, we become more awakened. My ears just started ringing. Cool. Yeah. Cause it's happening. I mean, we're, we're in, we are, we are, well, you can ask different astrologers and they'll have different opinions as to when we transitioned into the age of Aquarius, but the, the actual signs, uh, you know, so there's the age of Pisces that we just came from or no Capricorn, no Pisces. You're going to have to edit that part out. Um, <laughs> but the age of Aquarius, um, is, is, there, these ages, these cycles are like two to 3000 years long. And so it takes two or 300 years to transition into them. So we could have very well been transitioning into the age of Aquarius, like back in the forties and the suffrage, or even before that, you know? And so we're just seeing there's a paradigm 
paradigm shift happening right now. I, I mean, I don't think, I don't think we can deny it at this point. There's a lot of changes really fast. I mean, it's, it feels like, you know, everything is happening really rapidly with our own growth and the change of the earth and how we're being faced with the fact that, you know, we may not have our planet in the way that it is. So, um, it's happening. So you might as well jump on board and be a part of the change, you know, it, what which you clearly it? are already. <laughs> Oh, thanks. I'm just so fast. I'm just so pulled by it. There's nothing else I want to talk about. There's nothing else I really care about. And I mean, I feel like that's kind of bad to say, but I care about nature. Uh, I care about spiritual growth and ways that people connect and psychedelics. And that's really what I want to devote my life to. Nothing else does it for me like that. And then like falling, getting into all the people. And so when people are like, oh, pick your ideal client, I'm like, how do you do that with spirit? Because I can see myself going to schools and teaching kids about consciousness and the earth and different things like that. I can see it with athletes, like igniting their mental connection and their thing in their spiritual connection to their body. And then with the, anybody else who's just trying to awaken and evolve, it's like, it just is lights me up more than anything. That's why I love podcasting because I get to talk to people about stuff I love. And it's like, I'm infinitely curious and lit up by it. I don't see it ever ending. And it's cool because I don't have to be the expert in everything. I can just be the curious student. Who's like, tell me everything. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I won't claim to be an expert, but I will definitely share what I, what I have learned. And, um, yeah, yeah, I I can tell, like, that was one of the reasons I wanted to do this with you because you just have this, um, light, you make it easy, you know, for, for good, juicy information to come out. So thanks. Thank you for that. And I have two questions um, left that I kind of have been asking. Well, this, this first one I added in because I was asking my, the mentors in my life, but I find it really important to ask. And I was curating something for spirit school, almost like, I don't like the word commandment. So I'm going to have to come up with something else, but almost like a virtue. So all the mentors that are coming on spirit school, I've been asking them, what is the one piece of advice that you would pass down to your younger self on your spiritual journey, or maybe somebody that's starting out that you found out later that you're like, Oh, Oh, Mm. Oh, um, trusting your intuition really, really like honing in on this. There's a, there's a, whatever you want to call it, a higher guide, um, spirit. Uh, there is the vital force um, within us and it is a guiding system and, you know, we have our, our compass, you know, the North star, right. The, the thing that we're being moved and pulled towards. And I would tell my younger self as crazy as it sounds, you know, when my intuitive hits come up and I'm like, what go to training for cannabis, you know, (laughs) um, just trust because it may not make sense. Um, and we don't understand how to plan things because life has a, has a plan and has, like I said earlier, these breadcrumbs of life that bring us to where we are. You know, I, I would not have ended up here if I didn't decide to go to nursing school, you know, if I didn't just jump into that, I mean, that was an intuitive hit that I was like, all right, I'm doing it, you know, and, and here I am now. So I would, I would tell my younger self your intuition has got you just trust. So good. (laughs) And, um, you know, the podcast is called talking each other home. And so what is, what is home to you? Oh, um, you know, what's popping into my mind right now, home is, is my heart. Um, and it's home is loving others and even more importantly, loving myself, you know, and I think that's been a huge part of my journey is remembering my self-worth, uh, remember, remembering how much love there is and how loved I am. And so, yeah, home is, is my heart for Mm -hmm. sure. So sweet. I always, anytime somebody answers it and it's always different, which is really cool. Um, it just makes me melt because I can feel their sense of home and how it just, it feels like a warm hug, no matter where people describe it, um, just feels so beautiful. And I love what you said about your younger self and trusting your intuition. It's like, even I need that, that what a great reminder, 
you know, even no matter how far along you are in the journey, we don't always stay directly in a linear path. It's like not always straight upwards in growth. It's kind of like circular. And then you forget about your intuition and then, oh yeah, just ping pong. <laughs> um, awesome. I feel like there's one more thing I was going to say. Oh, that's okay. I'd love to um, just put a little ping in my upcoming um, virtual cannabis breathwork, cannabis assisted breathwork ceremony. Um, I'll be doing them monthly, but this next one is on Sunday, uh, February 26th. Um, and uh, yeah, you can go on my website to the events underneath the cannabis psychedelic page and you'll see uh, the dates that they are that I'm holding them every month. Yes. So, and then I would, uh, I'm so glad that you said that too. And I was going to ask, where can people find you? And I'm going to put all the links in the show notes. So it'll be really easy for people to just click and find you. Um, but if there's like an Instagram that you like or a website, um, yeah. Do you do anything on social media? I do. Yeah. So my Instagram is uh, nurse Nikki's underscore plant medicine, um, Facebook same uh, at nurse Nikki's plant medicine. And then my website is, um, nurse Nikki's with the S.com. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And then the event, and I, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, I was just saying the events will be there. We'll, we'll put that link as well. So people can find the cannabis events really easy. Um, and I think there's another one on March 26th that I see that correctly. Yes. In case yeah. this episode doesn't get out before February 26th. I want people to be ready for the next one. Perfect. And, yeah. and then signing up for that is easy. And there's a sliding scale and all of that good stuff too. Just yeah. Like sliding scale. And there's just a little, um, a, a safety self assessment, uh, obviously psychedelic work isn't for everybody. If there's really, um, you know, profound, trauma in the past, I, I recommend working with a psychotherapist who does psychedelic therapy in any modality with any plant medicine, uh, especially in groups, you know, this is meant for, um, I mean, you can certainly move through some traumas, uh, but we just want to make sure that you have the appropriate support. So if there's, if there's any concerns, like, please reach out and we can talk through it and decide if it's a right fit for you. Awesome. And if you're going to do the cannabis ceremony with Nikki, bring headphones, bring good headphones because her music was on another level. And I was appreciating every little like ping and beat and all that for me, the music, I'm so tuned into music right now. Even, I mean, I have been for a while, but probably the last year has been very specific with my yoga classes, my own journeys, and then noticing yours. And when I did ayahuasca, everything was just like the music is so important. <laughs> it's freaking me so, out. It's like the best part. I mean, again, the little breadcrumbs, like I, I'm a singer, I play the ukulele and I absolutely love music. I listen to music all the time. And before I did this training, I was really listening to a lot of this sort of ethereal, um, spiritual music for lack of a better term. And then I started doing this training and I was like, oh my God. So I get to actually DJ as well. <laughs> I get to bring my witchiness. I get to DJ. I, it's just magic. And you it's brought so your journal cards and did a, a, a perfect reading for afterwards. Like that email, I was like, well, all three of those are perfectly spot on. Um, yeah. And I didn't, I had a feeling you were a singer because your voice is so beautiful and feels like it's just, it just resonates really pretty. Um, and I just have a question because this is a journey I'm on right now myself is finding my voice and mm -hmm. learning how to use it. Um, and it's not even, I guess, having it sound good, but it's almost unlocking that part to where there's no inhibitions and ayahuasca helped with that. Um, and I sing in the car and now I sing with the music a lot lower. Sometimes I sing and just hear my own voice, which I never thought I'd be able to do. So I feel myself going that way. I've just been told my whole life that I'm tone deaf. <laughs> I don't think oh. I am, but well, cause my sister could sing and then I, I couldn't really, but I don't, I don't believe that to be true anymore. I feel like there's something there. So, you know, and I'm just so curious about your journey to finding your voice and what that's been like. Well, I, I just want to comment on, on that piece, you know, think about how many kids have been told that they're not creative or they're not an artist or they don't sing. And then you grow up your whole life, not pursuing any creative outlets, which I think is pretty integral part of being human because somebody told you that. So kudos to you for, 
for being like, no, I'm going to find my voice and I'm missing. Um, for me, I mean, I, it started when I was really young and I was always singing and, you know, went to a magnet school for the arts and was in chorus. So it was, it was just a part of my, you know, I, I never, in fact, when I'm not singing, I know there's something going on emotionally <laughs> because I'm not singing. And then I can tell like when things are starting to lift, I'm like, la, 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 you know, all the time. So, um, yeah, singing is, is just so good for the soul. And, you know, and I think the whole idea of being tone deaf, it doesn't matter. Sing, it's your voice. It's your vibration in life. So that's awesome. Okay. Well, that's really cool. Do you, have you ever thought about incorporating that with your cannabis ceremonies? I have, I'm still, I'm, I'm finding my confidence in that realm. You know, it's like, I've, I've been doing these now for a year and a half and, um, I continue to add more things as I am building in my foundation of, you know, what, how I want to present these circles. So yes, absolutely. Um, it will happen. I have singing bowls. So when I'm in person, I place some singing bowls for a portion of it. And I've been playing around with my voice and just trying to figure out how to bring it in, especially in the online space, um, you know, how to bring it in without being like jarring or because it's certainly going to change, you know, the energy of, of, of the experience. So it'll happen. It's a part of it. Yeah, for sure. Definitely is. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's good to know. Well, Nikki, yeah. this has been so amazing. Thank you for sharing your time and energy with us and, and just your journey really and all the stuff that you picked up along the way. I think people are really going to love this episode. I certainly did. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for just asking such inspiring questions. Yeah. Your curious mind is a beautiful thing. Mm. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, everybody it's check out Nikki on her website, sign up for the cannabis journey. I will see you there probably. And, um, yeah, I thank you for your time and energy listening to us for another episode and we will see you on the next one. Peace. Bye everybody.